Hi, my name is Jess Bradman, and I'm an associate professor at the Graduate School of Commerce and Management here at Stotsbach University. I focus on international management, which means that I'm interested in how companies, governments, and NGOs function in our very dynamic and complex world. My most recent research focuses in particular on how Japanese companies are trying to introduce more diversity in their workforce and the implications that this has for both their management practices and their sources of competitive advantage in the global economy. Over the past few years, diversity has become a hot topic in Japan. In particular, Japanese companies have put more and more effort on hiring and promoting both women and foreigners within their ranks. At the same time, the government has passed laws that also aim to promote more female managers and also is introducing regulations that make it easier for foreigners to come to Japan and work here for local companies. Indeed, as of April 2016, all companies with more than 300 employees must have plans in place that show how they will promote more women to become managers. Similarly, regulations are now in place to encourage foreigners to enter Japan and work for Japanese companies. While these efforts are still in their infancy, they do suggest that the days of the traditional Japanese salary man are past. So what's driving this recent focus on diversity? Well, one major factor, of course, is the shrinking and aging Japanese population. As the left-hand side graph shows, the Japanese population peaked out in the year 2015 and has since started to gradually decline. As this decline continues, companies are, of course, facing a severe labor gap. As the right-hand side graph shows, the number of jobs on offer per university student have skyrocketed over the past few years. By focusing on diversity, Japanese companies are able to expand beyond their traditional talent pool of Japanese males and thus fill this labor gap. However, the recent emphasis on diversity is also a result of increasing pressures for globalization on Japanese companies. Now, this might at first seem strange. After all, companies like Toyota, Sony, Nintendo have been on the global markets for decades. And indeed, it's true, most Japanese companies do have international sales. And yet, at the same time, the vast majority of Japanese companies have also viewed their domestic market as the key source of revenues. However, as that market shrinks due to the declining population, Japanese companies are facing more and more pressure to go abroad to new foreign markets, particularly the rapidly growing emerging markets. This pressure for globalizing has only been made more acute by the rise of regional rival companies from South Korea, China, and Taiwan, among others. In order for Japanese companies to be truly global and competitive, they must have employees with different perspectives and experiences. A focus on diversity is, of course, a central part of that strategy. From a macroeconomic perspective, an increasing emphasis on workforce diversity will of course have positive benefits both by filling in the labor gap and also by increasing spending as more and more households will have dual incomes. The really interesting effect, however, is how an increasing number of women and foreigners will change traditional Japanese management practices. Japanese companies have long been famous for their unique management systems. Life employment, seniority-based pay, consensus-based decision-making, and on-the-job training through rotational assignments have all been identified as distinctive traits of the traditional Japanese corporation. Indeed, many scholars have suggested that these organizational practices underpin the competitive advantages that Japanese companies had during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Things like total quality management, just-in-time production, and process-based innovation were all seen as key parts of the Japanese corporation's practices. However, researchers have also suggested that traditional Japanese management practices may be one reason for why Japanese companies have struggled to maintain their competitiveness during the 1990s. In particular, many have suggested that organizational practices that put too much focus on organizational stability, incremental innovation, and long-term orientation are not well suited for our very disruptive and fast-moving 21st century economy. Regardless of whether you view Japanese traditional management practices as something positive or negative, there is little doubt 
that throughout the post-war period, Japanese companies operated on systems that were uniquely geared towards a homogenous male workforce. With the introduction of diversity, and in particular women and foreigners, those management practices are bound to change significantly. To give you one example, consider the impact that hiring more women may have on Japanese working hours. One of the defining traits of the post-war Japanese corporation was the long working hours of its employees. As the graph shows, Japanese men put considerably more hours into work than their OECD colleagues. Now in Japan, as in many other countries, women play a larger role in the family. This meant that for working mothers, they often had a difficult time maintaining the same number of hours as their male colleagues at work. This in turn served as a big hurdle for Japanese women to become managers in corporations. In order to overcome these obstacles, many Japanese companies have reduced their working hours, effectively forcing their workers to go home at 8 p.m. or even 6 p.m. And this includes both women and men. So why is this important? Well, it means that the same amount of work needs to be done in shorter hours. And this in turn means that many of Japanese traditional working practices need to be changed significantly. For example, decision making must become faster, meetings must become slower, less paper must be circulated to make a decision. Similarly, there's less time to put towards relationships. Hence, business interactions may become more contractual and less based on relational ties. Now, these may seem like quite obvious practices, but in fact, they constitute major changes from what we've always considered traditional Japanese ways of working. Accommodating more women and foreigners may also have an impact on career promotion and advancement. Japanese companies have long been famous for seniority-based promotion and the closely related lifetime employment system. Now this worked well in a large and growing homogenous population, but it's less well suited for a heterogeneous workforce where people have different needs. Things like flex time and work from home that are introduced to accommodate working mothers means that face time at the office becomes less good of a basis for promotion. Instead, performance is increasingly becoming the standard and the benchmark by which managers are selected. What this means, of course, is that seniority-based promotion, much like the lifetime employment system, may be disappearing from Japanese companies. Another area of change is, of course, communication. The Japanese language has often served as the primary tool by which employees have been able to share knowledge and communicate with each other. And in particular, the nuances of the Japanese language have served to bind people together within the organization. However, with the introduction of foreigners, many of whom may not speak Japanese or understand its nuances perfectly, a number of corporations have made English their official corporate language. Many people view English as a more direct and straightforward language. Communicating in this language, hence, means that decisions are more likely to be based on different viewpoints, which then come into direct contact with each other. As a result, the traditional consensus style of decision making where nuances matter, may become less important, while more direct, straightforward discussion styles in English will become the norm. The changes to Japanese traditional management practices that have been brought on by this emphasis on diversity, these are important changes because they have the potential to alter the very competitive advantages of Japanese companies. Competitive advantages are basically the organizational capabilities, routines, and processes of an organization. It's DNA, if you will. Now, Japanese companies have long viewed their traditional management practices as a key source of that DNA, of their competitive advantage. And of course, as the DNA changes, so too does their competitive advantage. So to give you an example, there is a lot of research that shows that diverse teams and multicultural teams are, perform less well when it comes to incremental process innovation, but outperform when it comes to radical innovation. Now, Japanese companies have traditionally focused more on process-based incremental innovation. So the implication is that this diversity, these new teams, they may in fact enhance Japanese companies' capabilities, not only for new product development, but indeed for their flexibility 
and ability to engage in organizational change. Such organizational flexibility and innovation are crucial elements for any firm that seeks to compete in the global economy. So in this way, the introduction of diversity and from that new capabilities can actually lead to greater competitive advantage for Japanese companies in the global economy. In sum, the recent focus on diversity is important, not just because it has the potential to have positive macroeconomic effects, but also, perhaps more importantly, because it has the potential to change what it means to be a typical Japanese company and how Japanese firms compete in the global economy. Of course, these changes will not be easy. And indeed, this is one of the main challenges facing Japanese companies at this very moment. As they embrace diversity, as they seek to make themselves more, more global, Japanese companies must ask themselves very important questions. Who are we? What do we want? And what does it mean to be a Japanese company? These questions were far easier to address at a time when you had a homogenous workforce and there was a clear identity and a sense of understanding what it meant to be a Japanese company. But in a diverse world, such answers are not so clear cut anymore. Indeed, we may no longer have the idea of a typical Japanese company. Many of Japan's most successful firms today are in fact characterized by atypical management practices and organizational structures that are very different from those of a typical traditional Japanese company. So in the future, what we may have is more heterogeneity in Japan as well. We may have some companies that indeed do embrace their diversity and their international aspects and become more globally competitive. And then we may have others that put much more emphasis on their traditional Japanese identity and see this as a core competitive advantage. Whatever happens, in whichever way the Japanese companies go, there is little doubt that diversity in its introduction into Japan will have a lasting impact on Japanese companies, the way they do business, and their role in the global economy.